All right, we're ready to begin our third debate presentation. Thank you for those of us who have who've stuck with us through the whole thing. Um, our next speaker is our unbiased introduction from Jennifer Finitzer from Washington State University. Thank you, Rebecca. First today, I would like to provide you with a general background of pesticide resistance. Then I would like to introduce several techniques in pest management. And finally, I will provide a general overview of our debate topics, implementing either pesticide-free refuges versus pesticide rotation. The basic definition of pesticide resistance involves the shift of genetics in pest populations, allowing the previously susceptible populations to survive. These heritable traits are selected for by our management processes. This is an evolutionary benefit to the arthropod species, but we are left reeling to debate uh, how to address these concerns, affecting both economic and public health worldwide. There exist many examples of pesticide resistant species sharply inclining in the 1940s and 50s. It is important to analyze the extent and impacts these arthropods have in context to our world. This is not only to document, but also to suggest that we need to constantly consider new approaches. These top resistant arthropods are classified by the number of unique chemical compounds they are reported to show resistance to. Provided on the screen are just a few examples of the top 20 resistant arthropod species. Um, first, we have the agricultural type pests, including the two-spotted spider mite, which is a general feeder on many crops, as well as the Colorado potato beetle, which feeds on solanaceous plants, including tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and peppers. Secondly, we have the public concern species of flies, including the housefly, which transmits bacteria, musca domestica, and the, my favorite mosquito, the Culex pipiens, which is a key vector for West Nile virus. Finally, we must consider our veterinary impacts, which also impact us economically, including the southern cattle tick, which parasitizes many of our livestock, as well as the sheep blowfly, which causes discomfort, stress, and even death in the animal. In order to manage pesticide resistance, there are three key strategies we must consider to implement in pest management. These strategies include to first avoid de development of this resistance, delay this resistance through monitoring, and then to promote the reversal of these populations over time. Some things we should take into consideration in pest management include the effects and beneficial species. These can be natural enemies of our concerned, uh, of the pest, pest species we're concerned about, including predators such as the lady beetle and lacewing, as well as parasitoid wasps. It's also important to consider, as Hoy at all mentions, um, to use the word mitigate versus manage. The word management suggests that we have full success in tackling this issue, whereas mitigate implies that we will just lessen the gravity of these circumstances. Excuse me. She also outlines the limitations and complications of field-based trials and modeling. Often field trials are completed under lab conditions, and this doesn't allow for the colony to have natural migration into it, thus eliminating the flow of genetic material. Oops. Finally, there are three key approaches in management uh, of utilizing pesticides, which leads to our debate today. The conservative approach is utilizing IPM practices um, such as threshold and development time, as well as unsprayed reservoirs. This moderate approach is the most conservative of the three approaches. Secondly, we have the rotation approach, which utilizes cost as a key consideration. This includes mixtures, um, and these rely on different mixtures and modes of application to be continuously developed. Finally, the saturation method is the high cost and seemingly high reward strategy of the three. This is generally used, though, as a last resort and often takes little consideration into these natural enemy populations. Today we'll be focusing generally on the first two of the strategies I mentioned. Um, which of these is the single best tool for manage managing pesticide resistance? Thank you.
We'll now have our first introduction from one of our debating teams. Florida A&M will be defending pesticide-free refuges. Hello, I'm Eric Turner and I'm on, uh, from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University and these are my teammates, Tavia Gordon, Whitley Stewart and Xavier Price. And we're here to tell you that pesticide free refuge is the single best tool for managing uh, pesticide resistance. Before we begin, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, it's been over 50 years since the discoverer of DDT won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And unfortunately, this discovery and other insecticide discoveries were followed closely by the development of res resistance. And with this, this is not the first occurrence of insecticide resistance in a pest species. You have the San Jose scale as res with resistance to lime sulfur, and then you have the coddling moth resistant to lead arsenate, but this is one of the more notable ones. And information from the FAO shows that the number of species in insect and mites worldwide have developed resistance to one or more chemicals ha and has increased and continues to rise, uh, said by George Al, 1994. And as we begin, our definition of a pesticide-free refuge is a non-treated area which provides a breeding ground for pests, and the majority of which will be susceptible uh, to pesticides, uh, as said by Frisvold and Rees in 2007. And the history of this, uh, this wonderful strategy is that the refuge strategy was mandated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 1996 to manage the evolution of resistance in some sexually reproducing diploid insects, uh, pests targeted by Bt corn and cotton. And, uh, okay, sorry. And then the US EPA also requires growers who plant Bt corn and to plant non-Bt corn to serve as a refuge for susceptible pests to delay resistance. And yes, this is intransigent at COPS, but see, you implementing this legislation to avoid this problem beforehand is, I believe, just absolutely wonderful. And then refuges pr preserve the efficacy of Bt varieties over a longer period of time. And in a field, uh, you see the inheritance of resistance, and you have the homo uh, the different, I'm sorry, resistant and susceptible alleles mating to avoid, I'm sorry, let me, okay, sorry. You have different uh, alleles. You have the homozygous dominant resistant, and you have the homozygous recessive uh, breeding to create heterozygous species that uh, are carrier for resistant genes. And over time, the F2 generation, you have the heterozygous uh, carriers producing at least a 25% chance offspring of resistant and a 25% chance of receptible, which you're still carrying, uh, allowing the resistant population to exist with the other offspring. And then that legis legislation for toxin-free refugia provides one of the best available means for conserving insect susceptibility. And a refuge strategy is used worldwide to delay the evolution of pesticide resistance and insecticides. And management of insecticide resistance, not, it just doesn't de uh, depend on modifying the way the insecticides are deployed, but also reducing the total number of treatments applied. And for us, the benefits of a pesticide-free refuge, you have first sanctuary of natural enemies. When ap uh, insecticides are applied, you're not just hitting the target species, you're also uh, natural enemies are affected by uh, applications of, pestic uh, of pesticides. You have reducing selection pressure. Uh, for an, a refuge that is not treated, you're allowing a lot of the susceptible genes to continue to proliferate in there. And then you also have cost effective. It doesn't uh, cost as much to sec section aside of your crop to allow uh, for a refuge. Um, it's easy to maintain. You're not, it's a pesti pesticide-free refuge, so you're not treating it. So that also that saves you money on uh, continual applications and you're sectioning it off. Also, it preser preserves, once again, susceptible genes. And then there's less regulation to implement a refuge in uh, farming as well. Pesticide-free refuges would be the best tool for countries that are less developed, which faces most problem with pesticide resistance. Also, it would be most, uh, most feasible option taking into account the economy, health, and the environment. The strategy reduces exposure of pests to pesticides simply by decreasing the number of applications made. This is the first and unquestionably most productive line of attack and nonetheless minimize the use of chemicals. In our concluding remarks, we have a pesticide refu refuge is very easily established. This does delay and reverse resistance and it is the single best tool to manage pesticide resistance. Thank you.
You may begin your cross-examination period, Nebraska. In your definition for pesticide-free refuge, you cite the Frisvold and Reeves 2007 paper, which I believe is the economics of it. And in that paper, there they also do economics on pesticide or on refuges where sprays are applied to the pesticides. Could you repeat? You said so I'm, I'm trying to. I guess what my question is: your definition doesn't match the citation. So what I would like to know is, is your definition, it is zero pesticides, you can't spray in that, like you plant your transgenic, and then you can't spray another crop or another chemical to control that pest. A sprayed refuge is the question. One more time. Okay, we have other questions, All so right. we can you make use of the time. Uh, how you guys would differentiate refuge from scape crops or stable zone? What I want to add is, is that your refuge necessarily needs to be the same crop species, or are you considering a refuge uh, other, other plants or from other species? Uh, uh, another question would be, if you talk, if you're defending pesticide-free refuge, we know that in some cases refuge need to be receives pesticide application, which is the case of corn and Bt. So how we are going to discuss on pesticide free refuge if your answer includes application in some cases on the refuge? I, I, have, an, I have another question. Is, um, so, so they actually are able to respond during this okay, period. Sorry. So go ahead and on the next one. us, our definition of with refuge, with refuge is that we've always said that the refuge is the crop grown. It's not going to be a different crop from uh, the what uh, from being planted. It's always going to be the crop grown. Would that allow for a spray from a non-related chemical class into the refuge, though? No, no okay. a pesticide-free refuge is not using any pesticides at all. Okay. Uh, what is the concentration that you use in the treated area? Are you use a high dose concentration? Or is like a uh, refuge with other type of concentration? With a refuge, we're, uh, we're not using any concentrations of uh, that. It is to section off the area. It is going to be about a 20% of the actual crop that's receiving no treatment whatsoever. So high dose, low dose doesn't necessarily apply to a, ref a refuge if it's pesticide-free treatment to begin with. All right, thank you. Our next presentation will be from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and they're defending pesticide rotations as the best tool. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you for the AM for the presentation. We acknowledge that pesticide refuges and pesticide rotations walk hand in hand in good resistance management tool, but when having to pick a single best strategy for this debate, we believe that Pesticide rotations are our best bet. Our team members are representing the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and are myself, Camila Hoffman, Mateo Ribeiro, Carolina Camargo, and, Ma and Chris Magola. First, I want to give you the definition of what we mean by when we say um, rotations. Rotations are the sequential alteration of pesticides over time with discrete modes of action and or different resistance mechanisms. Rotations can be applied within a single or overlapping past generations. Rotations are also a planned strategy consistent with IPM practices. This means that we should take in consideration scouting, um, sampling, and the past life cycle before we make a rotation program. We picked rotation of pesticides as our topic because they have had a long history of success in delaying resistance to pesticides. They're also broadly applied in different sectors worldwide. They can also be used in preventative and curative resistance management programs. And lastly, they have a practic practical use and adoption in different sectors. 
We are, however, making assumptions when we talk about rotations. We're saying that individuals resistant to the first treatment will be killed by the subsequent treatment from a different mode of action. Ideally, we'll also see a fitness cost associated with this resistance. This means that the individuals that are resistant will lose performance when compared to the susceptible individuals in the absence of the compound that they're resistant to. And this will help us optimize our resistance management program because we will reduce the frequency of resistance alleles present in that population in that problematic area. Rotations are also very widely used and they can be used in, a different, um, in different scales. Rotations can be successfully used in large cotton areas to delay resistance of Helicoverpa or Midra, but they can be easily used and successfully used to protect panchettas in a greenhouse setting. They also have different scales, such as um, use for cattle, use for mosquitoes or medical use, also for urban pests. And lastly, they can also revert, revert susceptibility but through the use of negative cross resistance. Rotations can be used as preventative and curative control. Most recently, there has been a program developed to delay resistance to diamine insecticides. Diamines are a new class of insecticides, so it's very critical that we try to extend the useful life of this new class of insecticide as much as we can. There has also been successful cases of um, rotations being used in curative programs, again with the case of Helicoverpa misura in cotton. Rotations are a strategy recommended and applied worldwide. Rotation is strongly supported by the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee guidelines. They say that rotations are a key element in insect, insect resistance management. The modes of action classification scheme that currently has 25 modes, known modes of action plus the unknown modes of action is used by many sectors as a strategy to manage resistance. So by alternating those uh, modes of action, we are mitigating resistance. Rotations are also easily integrated into current pest management programs. What we're trying to say here is that with the tools that are already available to control pests, um, we can integrate rotations with already available tools. So. Rotations also allow flexibility to incorporate new technologies coming in the market in the preventative and curative insect resistance management programs. Rotations can also achieve the control of main and sec secondary pest complexes together. So when planning a rotation schedule, one should consider the whole pest complex, not only a single pest. Rotations are also adaptive to the dynamics to agri of agricultural systems. So if there is, um, if, <laughs> sorry. If there is a, a case where a pesticide is failing or succeeding, or in a case or that we're starting to see resistance to a chemical compound or a chemical class, we can adapt the rotation schedules moving for, forward almost immediately. Growers in other sectors are also willing to adopt rotations as they are well aware of the economic consequences of uncontrolled resistance. Lastly, we want to conclude that we know there's no silver bullet approach uh, for insecticide resistance management. We know that rotations in refuges work hand in hand with row crops, but when it comes to high value crops, greenhouses, veterinaries, medical uses, urban pests, also to applicability to a broad range of arthropod pests and to the control of entire pest complexes, not only single pest species, uh, rotations, are far superior than refuges. Our take home message is that in a good insect resistance management program, we should consider the use of multiple strategies to manage resistance. However, for this debate, we're picking the single best strategy and rotation should be considered the single best strategy. Thank you everyone. And now we would like to open for clarifications from the FEMU team.
FAMU, you may begin your three-minute cross-examination. Okay. Well, uh, for our first question, if resistance is already exist, how can the, fre the frequency of resistance allele be reduced by with rotations? Uh, you reduce the resistance of the allele by uh, applying the next insecticide. Since it's a different mode of action, you are just reducing that population. Um, according to um, insect, the Insect Resistance Action Committee, there are approximately 27 modes of action and 28 classes. And um, currently, there are, there are over 580 species of, resist, of, insect, of species that are resistant to one or more insecticides. How uh, is rotation? How, 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 is, how is rotation? going to help with so many um, species being resistant to one or more insecticides. If you're trying to mention cross resistance or something on the, these lines, as mentioned on our presentation, we can make use of products that has unknown mode of actions, include them in our rotation program. Usually cross resistance would be a very high limitation for the implementation of rotations, but we can get a hold of that, making use of products that tar target or select for different mechanisms of resistance. With, uh, with that, the negative cross resistance, can you give a better definition, or can you clear, uh, clarify the definition of negative cross resistance? Negative cross resistance occurs when resistance to compound A shifts back when compound B is applied. Okay. Um, uh, following that, that line, um, in, in the paper by uh, Pedendrick uh, in Negative cross resistant History, Present Status, and Emerging Opportunities, it, it is uh, it's specified, it is not known to what extent the industry has used these symptoms to develop NCR. However, no uh, NCR-based products have been forthcoming. Uh, could you give an example or uh, more so clarify about some of the products that could be used and how cost effective and easy, uh, easily applied it would be in this situation. So uh, for negative cross resistance is one of the applications that we can have with rotations. Negative cross resistance won't be our main strategy to manage resistance, is that we can negative cross res use negative cross resistance with rotations. We have some examples uh, with twice uh, house flies in, 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 in that paper, and it could be a, a good option that we could be including rotations, but it's not our main strategy. Our main strategy is rotations. And just to complement, I think your question came with something about how we identify those negative cross-resistance compounds. So we for sure need to have carry out some... I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to both teams. So we're going to begin our rebuttal period. You'll get three minutes and alternate. You are able to ask the other team questions or make statements and arguments, but if you ask a question, the other team obviously can't answer until their rebuttal period comes up. And in this case, we're going to ask Nebraska to go first. One of your benefits, you say, for the use of refuges is that it's more friendly on the environment and like a reduced pesticide load. And with some of your references, the size of the refuge is 4% of uh, like that total acre. So it's out of 100 acres, you have four acres. And I guess I would say I have trouble believing that just 4% of the total acreage is really making an impact on reduced pesticide loads. So are you confusing? the use of BT or other transgenic crops with what the refuge is actually imparting in terms of environmental benefits or benefits to natural enemies? Uh, also, your strategy is pesticide-free refuge, but how do you control that that area is not going to be um, eliminated by the pest and maybe also uh, you won't have that susceptible population to migrate and really cross with those resistant individuals. What I mean, you really need a, a crop that maintains that susceptible population, and if you don't have it, you don't have susceptible alleles. Uh, also, how you would manage strictly with refuge pests that are pomitic parthenogenesis, pests that have a very low economic threshold, or pests that are non-mobile? 
One of the benefits we've shown with rotations is that it's applicable to many situations. You guys mentioned some row crop examples with refuges. Uh, are there any examples of refuges for urban pests or veterinary, like cattle, that you can illuminate us with? Or yeah. How do you avoid that uh, insects that are in the, in the treated area or they have resistant alleles don't move to that uh, refuge area and inbreed? and have resistant individuals. You probably will have resistant individuals also migrating there. And also, how do you manage uh, resistant when it's um, not completely recessive or you have dominant traits in those alleles? Also, uh, with rotation, we can plan a program to work and manage, mitigate resistance, not only to a single target species, we can make that useful for a complex of species that are always present in the crops. How can you apply refuge as a single best management practice to manage a complex of pests, not only one target single species? You talk about refuge as being pesticide free, so what do you say about drift when you're spraying airily and there's drift into your pesticide free refuge? And also to complement that, refuge has different designs. So it's hard to have a pesticide-free refuge with refuge in a bag. <laughs> it's always you. <laughs> All right, FAMU, you may begin your rebuttal. Okay. Um, for example, uh, examples of, um, I'm sorry, the examples of uh, other refuges that we use for veterinary pests. Uh, there, there's a paper uh, that specifies that uh, we can use natural areas like with mosquitoes, leaving areas such as the swamps and other that to uh, leave those alone to be treated where you shouldn't be in the first place to allow the susceptible genes to continue into the population. Also, you talked about movement with, uh, from resistance into the uh, refuge. That's, that's the overall goal of refuge is to preserve all the species and eventually having uh, you uh, identify that there's a fitness cost associated with that is to have the susceptible genes eventually breed out the resistant genes and uh, reintroduce susceptibility and in turn increase uh, if you go back to rotation and using the uh, increasing the utility and efficacy but after the refuge and the susceptible genes are back in the population. I believe we have some more questions. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, drift. To deal with drift, uh, there there are some uh, specifications for a refuge to be able uh, needs to be sectioned off and farther away from the co crop than the rest of the actual. Like it doesn't need to be right there, just right next to it. It needs to be with at least, I believe, one of our papers says in a half mile uh, from to avoid drift into, but still ha allow for the migration of pests. Yeah into the um, into the refuge and uh, I believe you also want to uh, address how do we address a, a complex of pests the refuge is for it's non treated for for everything so natural enemies get to go in there the complex of other pest species get to go and stuff like that as, mm -hmm. as well um, to add to what Eric said earlier there was a paper in your guys that you guys are cited by um, Zahiri in 2002 where the um, immigration of susceptible mosquitoes from untreated areas to the treated field um, resulted in a decline in resistance. And that species, species was a Culex quinque fasciatus. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, a question that we have for you is uh, how long would uh, the rotation strategy be applied to deal with a certain pest species? Um, um, in your den home paper, um, it talks about um, haploid diploidy and um, white flies. So how do you plan to combat resistance with rotations and pests that possess a breeding system just like haploid diploidy? Also, in a paper by Belza in 2008, where... All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and begin your second rebuttal. Okay, 
Okay, for the, the home paper on the haplodiploid, I think uh, that characteristic will be uh, more will be more negative for refuge than rotations because for rotations we will apply a pesticide after and we are not depending on how insecticides cross. When haplodiploid, it will it will the the resistant allele will be one, in one of the of the individuals and will affect more. When, when you are basing your strategy in, in cross between individuals. So we believe that, that for rotation, haplodiploid is not a characteristic that, that, that is uh, that important and is for refuge. Uh, regarding your question about the Culex quinquen fasciatus, uh, <clears throat> the paper clearly shows that resistance was, uh, susceptibility was partially recovered and not fully recovered. So that may be a combination of several factors that affects much more refuge than rotation, such as the movement of the pests, inter-guild competition, and things like that. In terms for like an end point of how long the rotation would be applied, it would just be good um, I want to say caretaking of our chemical classes or the insecticides that are applied to continue applying rotation. So it's not like there's ever going to be an end point. It was just you keep ro working in the new classes. So you just keep rotating, trying to, del to delay resistance as much as possible since we know that risk resistance is kind of a re red queen race and that you're racing to the next insecticide or pesticide to be released so you can change or integrate a new mode of action. But I'd like to ask again, you guys didn't get to it, but we had asked the question about how would you manage um, parthenogenic pests, I believe, strictly with a refuge? Um, so um, with, with, a, with a free refuge, it seems that it's a uh, proactive or a preventative strategy for resistance. But usually what happened in the field is resistance is reported when the growers can see it. So how can you use refuge to really uh, revert or use it as a reactive management strategy? It seems it's just a proactive strategy. And also how can you use refuges in cases of um, disease vectors that um, while well, human disease vectors as well as pests with very low economic thresholds? high value crops. When I asked about normal biopests, I was talking about entrants from the refuge. <laughs> <laughs> it's a curse. Okay. All right, FAMU, go ahead. Okay. For, um, the, the overall goal for a refuge is to reduce selection pressure, and that is to, eliminate, uh, to create susceptible genes. And using a pesticide-free refuge, that's the overall goal. So without rotating, you have the the susceptible genes in there and eventually allowing them out. Resistance is a losing battle for both sides. But refuge, we're, our overall goal is to reduce selection pressure because if there's no really selection pressure, there's no need for the species to have changed in the first place. And uh, I would also like to reply with a question, how would you, uh, how would you manage a, uh, with rotation a resistant species uh, insect that's already resistant to many things such as the Colorado potato beetle? <laughs> Um, to add to what Eric um, stated, um, resistance only occurs where there is pressure and refuge, refu refuge allows interbreeding between treated and non-treated insect population, thus diluting the genes of resistance. Besides in the laboratory, how do you know that the cryptic species is actually being, um, I guess, killed by rotational strategy with your pesticide? It's the McKinsey, um, is it McKinsey? Yeah, it's McKinsey et al. 2013 paper. They talk about cryptic species. Uh, 
There's one on the For the Colorado potato beetle, um, that beetle is resistant to all classes of insecticides. Or are you going to manage resistance using rotation for the Colorado potato beetle? Um. In, also in the McKinsey uh, 2013 paper, there's a, there's a part where they they, they talk about the alternate use of insecticides that had little influence on uh, previously acquired resistance, permethrin resistance reverted, reverted uh, towards susceptibility, but the reversion was not stable and increases the level of resistance after reintroduction of that in class of insecticides. So how would you comment? <laughs> <laughs> Darn that bell. All right, so we're going to begin our 10-minute Q&A. Um, for those of you who are just here for the last debates, we're going to allow the judges to ask questions first, and then we'll have Anybody in the audience line up at either of our two microphones? One person, one question. Um, that way we can make sure everybody gets a fair shot at asking the team's questions. So do we have anything from our judges to start? Hi. So I have two questions, one for each team. Um, I'm going to ask FMU my first one. So UNL asked, how would you use refugia in environments with low to no economic threshold? So for example, in an infestation of bed bugs, how would you use refugia when you can't leave an area of a home untreated? For that, for, for, with loca, uh, for that, for that example, I would have to say to, uh, yes, you would use the, uh, completely treat that, but you would have to leave that up to the natural areas where bed rugs and hopefully that you would use that to influence the population to combat that, to allow natural areas to hold those uh, before uh, and allow the susceptible genes to be reintroduced only that way. Not, you, you can't really, uh, that's, that's difficult. <laughs> So UNL, you mentioned rotating, but what do you rotate to in situations where there are no alternative classes that are available to rotate to? So for instance, with bed bugs, when the only class is pyrethroids, what do you rotate to? Well, in this case, I think uh, would be very interesting, of course, uh, we need time to test all products available, but we have plenty. Uh, plant secondary compounds that could be explored, such as natural oils, and also, again, compounds which unknown modes of action that may be targeting at the same time uh, different targets on the insect system, such as azadiaractin. So what essential oils would work in a situation for bed bugs, and how could you use an insecticide that has an unknown mode of action? Would it be approved by the EPA? Well, azadiaractin is approved by EPA. Against bed bugs? No, it's approved by EPA for agricultural use, that I'm sure. I'm not a bed bug specialist. Mm -hmm. I watch your talk, I know you are. <laughs> uh, um, it's hard to manage and mitigate resistance in cases where the risk is very high and you don't have registered products. But if legislation open rooms for us to test, even if it's in laboratory level, those uh, plant secondary compounds, natural oils, and things like that, we may find positive responses. If I, oh, oh, I say, if I may add to it, maybe we just broaden our definition of what a pesticide would be and then rotate that to a slightly more expensive heat treatment. So uh, I, have a, I have another I think to add to that, uh, we know uh, pyrethroids are targeting the nervous system, but I know there are some studies uh, for malpigian tube control as well uh, in urban paths. So maybe we can just explore new mode of actions and start to using for rotations. Well, 
in this case, of course, we can't, right? <laughs> <laughs> you go to you go to the um, refugia. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you both made very good arguments for your different strategies, but ultimately the person, the end user, is the person making the decision. So what are your two best arguments for you to talk to a farmer about why you should use my suggestion? Either, either one of you can go for it. Oh, I guess we'll start. So, that was battle flightness. Um, the one thing I would say, well, one of the two things would be, with rotation, this allows you to treat, to treat the entire area that you are treating, rather than with refuge, you can only, you have to leave a certain chunk of what you've done. You have to leave it as a refuge for the susceptible, to maintain susceptibles. And then we're primarily talking pesticides that are spray applied. It's easy to do. You just change the chemical class. You don't have to worry about configurations or anything. You just dump in a new chemical and go spray. Any other countries where refuge is also being used, such as in Brazil, we have as a main problem in soybeans, the stink bugs. If you leave a large acreage, I would say hectares in Brazil, non-treated for stink bugs that they are feeding on your grains, you're not going to have a good harvest and you're going to lose money. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be a good way to say, use pesticide rotation because it's part of the daily basis of the farmer. We just need to make them aware of, you're not rotating products, you're rotating modes of action. FAMU? Um, I would tell the farmer to choose um, pesticide-free refuge because first and foremost, it um, increases the population of natural enemies such as predators, parasitoids, um, that are um, predators of the insect pests. It also reduces the amount of um, chemical applied to the field, thus um, lowering the rate of um, runoff in the environment, in the soil. It also reduces selection pressure. Um, you have more susceptible, um, a population of more susceptible insect pests, and then it lowers the cost to the farmer of applying insecticides and purchasing different classes of insecticide and rotating to control. So ultimately, it, co it costs the farmer a lot to purchase insecticide to control insect pests versus the refuge, which um, costs less, it is easy to establish, and it arbors um, many natural enemies of um, pests and predators of the insect pests in the field. Can we still add something on that? I we too. <laughs> we have, we I'm have a Go ahead more. and let us move on to the next question. <laughs> I appreciate your frustration, though. <laughs> yeah, I have a question for uh, Florida. Uh, for high-value crops, do you think pesticide refuse uh, uh, would be uh, feasible for a grower where, for example, in the crops where economic threshold value is very low and those are high value crops and these pesticide refuse, free, pesticide free refuse could harbor different pathogens, not only pests, and those pathogens uh, could have, you know, high impact on those high value crops like food crops and other spices and other, you know, high, high value crops. What do you think? I think the, the benefits out, outweigh the, the, the risk of uh, pathogens. If, you, if the refuges uh, could possibly hold more or make more opportunities for such as the pathogens, such as you mentioned, it also has the same chance to give you more natural enemies, gives you more uh, protects your environment. That, I just think the risk, out, or the, co the risk way outweigh the cost with the amount of stuff that they can bring in and then also com combating resistance and stuff like that. And then because when you're applying uh, many uh, insecticides, you also still, uh, still have the chance of opening up um, to secondary infections as well. So you're, you're leaving it alone to allow for susceptible genes. You're trying to make sure a secondary infection doesn't occur. And then that, because that's the principal goal of the, is to 
combat resistance. Do we have any more questions from the judges? Uh, kind of based on Sue's, um, for each team, you've made your plea to your farmer, homeowner, whatever, what kind of methods for accountability do you have so that you can see later on whether that's actually working in a real life scenario that's not an experimental plot? And we're short on time, I'm giving each of you 30 seconds. You're mentioning, Go. <laughs> you're mentioning costs, like? No, like accountability to see that what you have come up with is even working in well, the real world. Well, in I think we can make use of the most important tool to work with resistance, which is monitoring. So we apply that, and then we monitor that susceptibility over time in different locations. Uh, and to add to that, there is a We're big switch example over to FAMU. I'm so sorry. For, for the insect refuge, uh, or oh, sorry, the refuge, it's uh, surveillance. You already have legislation in place, such as uh, by the EPA, to mandate uh, a 20% rep, refuge for, uh, for the, the transgenic cops. And um, it, is pen, it is punishable if you're not using the, tw uh, the mandated amount of refuge for these transgenic cops. So I would have to say surveillance and then uh, the actual, legis ag actual legislation that exists for the refuge already. All right. We're done, guys. You did it. All right.